Good evening and welcome to With Jury. I have two guests tonight. Both of them have been separately on the show, but tonight I have them both. And I don't know if I can be able to contain them <laughs> because before we went on air, they were giddy, 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 giddy. But we're talking about intergenerational um, cohesiveness, if you will, and about some of the things that are happening with both of these folks in the upcoming weeks and months. With me is Jason McClellan, who is the Mm, let me see, how shall I put it? Being Seniors a, Program <laughs> Coordinator at the Gilbert Center. Welcome, Jason. Hey, Jerry, thank and you. And Ali Tucky, who is the Family and Youth Coordinator at um, the Gilbert Center, too. Both of you are here. Yeah, we work together. Yeah. Oh, do you? We came yeah. together. Did you really? It was wonderful. <laughs> 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 There's some exciting things happening with... Now, which one of you is older? Oh, you're very that kind. Would be me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be me. I tried to be kind. Right. I'm feeling really good right now. So Do you? Yeah. Good. Ask good. away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you work together in programs that are completely, I mean, one is a senior and one is youth. And how, how is this happening? And how did it come about that, that this is something that can work and, and bring... Um, challenges in terms of getting older folks and younger folks together. Jason, I'll ask you first. <laughs> you know, you, Got to you, respect you, your seniors, you, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll, right. I'll just take it back. I'll ask the old dude first. I'll ask the old dude first. <laughs> first right. Um, it, it really, we had a pretty creative boss, actually. I don't know if you know him, but, I don't, but uh, he was really good about talking about uh, getting different generations together to learn from each other. There's a huge history when we talk about older LGBT, the struggles they faced it for equality and, and those kind of things. And then the youth, I think, I think this is fair to say that the youth have different struggles, but they're still similar in different ways. So it's interesting to actually get the groups together and, and actually share that information and, and share you know different aspects of their lives and where they're at in their lives. And, and I actually find that seniors, uh, uh, older folks, have a, less of a filter as they seem to age. And the youth seem to kind of just say what's on their mind too. So it's actually been really educational for me over the I last think, six I months. I think you're right there because I, I did have a friend uh, who used to say, the older you get, the more like yourself you become. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I mean, we can see that happening in front of us right now. Right, I am a testimony to that <laughs> statement. <laughs> Allie, Allie, tell me, save us here. <laughs> I will do my best. <laughs> I think that the beauty of it is that um, the youth are now taking on the torch that, that the older folks within our communities have left behind. And it's important to connect on that. Like, where has that started where did it go to and what still needs to be done and me and jason have talked extensively around trans rights and how they were somewhat left behind in struggles that happened with lgb folks and um it's important that the youth are now taking on that torch and fighting for trans rights and i think that it is really important and good for that intergenerational approach to happen what have we done what have we done as a community what has worked what has not worked and where do we go from here uh, just getting to the not not leaving you out, of course, Jason. This month, no, okay. just getting just getting back to the youth piece. Uh, you say the youth taking up the torch. Is this something that they naturally want to do? Is is it, is it? Am I am I hearing that there's a generation of youth, LGBTQ youth, that are actually wanting to be more activists, more involved? Oh yeah, I would say. Um, for folks that are around my age, were. I would have considered myself an activist through university and get like now I'm approaching my 30s. I don't look like it. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm approaching my 30s and folks that are half my age are triple the times as more active and activist and political right. than I ever imagined myself to be. And I think that as as you look at into folks who are younger and younger and younger, we're getting involved in activist circles. Um, at younger ages, and I think a lot of that has to do with identity. There's a lot of trans folks within our community who are looking to take on that torch, mostly because they're looking around and seeing that they're being marginalized within their communities, and they're not okay with that. And so they're going to take that on and fight for themselves, as well as their friends, family members, people around them. Interesting. In 1969, uh, the Canadian government <laughs> finally decriminalized homosexuality. So a lot of seniors today grew up in their teenage years, like I'm talking seniors, folks that were born in the 50s, 60s, 
where, where being gay was a criminal offense. You could be locked up for it. That's changed now. Jason, what do you think about <laughs> what you do looking at? It's okay. Because you hear, you hear stats like, um, among LGBT stats, that 80, 80, um, most suicides among seniors are LGBT men in their 80s, uh, which is kind of alarming uh, because, wow, you live to be... Do you think it's because over the years they've been closeted or, or un, un, unwilling to come out and identify as being uh, gay? Well, I think people forget that people are conditioned, right? So yeah. as people in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and even to the 90s, we were all conditioned to that you got married, you had children, you bought a house, you lived your life, you raised grandkids, and then you went to wait for death because you weren't supposed to live past a certain age. Like, to go out and be active is just unheard of for some reason for an older, older generation. So, but now what's happening is, is as the youth and, and everybody starts to embrace the community, and I mean, the, our own community has to be an ally within the community too. So we have to create space for trans folks or youth to be heard because that's what a good ally does. Mm -hmm. um, but now the older folks are now discovering their sexuality again because their spouse has died, they're divorced, or whatever the case may be, or they identified um, as a trans person, that they should have those rights. So we're now seeing, um, like I have the pleasure of talking to people that are anywhere from 35 to 80 and 90 that have either late in their life transitioned, which is an incredible amount of courage, especially with, as they're older and their whole family and have children and all that. Um, or they're coming out of the closet, they're say, they, they have a partner that nobody knew about, um, you know, so all these things are kind of happening and, it's, and we try to support them in that, in that journey. And we also support the organizations because many of them have trouble with this too because this is a very new mm -hmm. kind of area because everybody had that same mentality growing up. And the people in, in long-term care is a prime example. If you go to high school with all that generation that called you, used queer as a derogatory term or called you fag or whatever they did to, to bully you, you're now facing all those same people in long-term care. Yes. So it becomes this cycle that, it's a cycle of life, right? So you're right. just ending up in the same situation you were when you were a teenager. Um, and you, you shouldn't be afraid to be who you are. So now we work with organizations and try to get inclusive space so people can just be who they are. But youth, Ali, would you say youth today is much more fluid? They're growing up in an era where at, at, at some point um, sex ed was in the curriculum. It's not now, but it was up until just recently. Where, where youth were given the opportunity to learn and discover and feel free to ask questions and be much more comfortable in identifying however that might be. Would you? Yeah, I would say that we're fortunate enough to be able to create communities and bubbles that are accepting of identities that are allowing folks to explore their gender identity as well as their sexualities. But I think that it's also important to recognize that sometimes those spaces are bubbles and when folks leave those bubbles, they are subject to bullying, harassment, and whatnot for being who they are. But that being said, we are lucky enough to be able to create cushiony bubbles within our community and spaces. And I think that that's the first step to having folks be more free to explore their sexuality or their gender identity. The whole concept, though, of this this marriage, if you will. <laughs> I love that. When did that happen? I love it. <laughs> I, must, I must be. Let the Alzheimer's the kicked in. Now. Did I sign anything? <laughs> I, I will. We have an unair marriage going on here. Perfect. Okay, so, so I the, do. Okay, the partnership. I marriage. Do marriage is such an old term anyway. <laughs> the, the partnership between um, seniors and youth is a is a partnership that it's not new there's been other partnerships such as uh, we've seen over the years where youth and uh, generational I'm looking at the states now and you have um, the president is like in his 70s and then along comes better or work I just found out today is launched a presidential campaign so there's a generational uh, thing is that are you trying, what is the scope of what you're trying to do in terms of your programming? To blend the two, to get youth to work with? Yeah, we are. We get youth to mean. work with, yeah. with, with seniors and seniors, but is it to benefit in terms of information or challenges that each can give one another? Because there's challenges on both ends. Right, but I also think it's kind of like a mentor kind of thing in creating space because many of the older LGBT and youth LGBT are isolated or they don't have, they've lost family or 
There's just so many commonalities. Actually, when you're talking about suicide rates, the youth LGBT has a huge, um, without support, huge suicide rates too. Right. So there's a lot of things that are common with an older generation and a younger generation. So it's like bridging those gaps to create some type of environment that everybody learns from everybody and we create um, relationships. You know, like let's adopt a grandparent. Like if, you ne if you've lost your family before what, because of your sexuality, Let's, let's embrace the older generation who's going to love you because that's who you are and, and they're not going to question it because they can relate to it. And, you know, and that's not to say everybody in the world is like that because there's lots of people that are supportive. But this is one of those, these two groups that are facing so many challenges as they move forward in regards to their sexuality. And, it, and it's just, we all need support in some manner or, not, or another. No, exactly, and, yeah. And we're not talking about sex. We're just, the, the human need for touch, like just or a hug or um, whatever the case may be, whatever, who's comfortable with what. Like, those are things that are basic needs for human beings. And right. it doesn't stop because you're older or younger. You still have that need. Ali, you had an issue down in Bradford recently. Oh my gosh, we're gonna jump right into that? <laughs> wow, <laughs> well, okay. who knew? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but it was it was sort of like somebody had, you were doing something at the Bradford um, Library and, and uh, some somebody in the community was concerned because it was younger and older. Right. Uh, tell me about that, because I know it even made, it even made the news up in, uh, in Barrie here. It did, it did. <laughs> Um, what I, did you do? <laughs> I didn't do anything. It was just Usually our program. it's me that does stuff, not you, you right? Usually. Sometimes it's me. That's fair. <laughs> so what it was was that person was concerned around children being um, exposed to folks who are in their 20s um, or even perhaps older and what that might look like in terms of grooming. But I think coming back to what Jason said, it's important to remember that within our communities, it's not... Like being queer or trans is not hereditary. And so therefore we don't instinctively just have biological family that can relate to us or have the same experience as us or who look like us. Um, and so a big part of queer culture is that we create chosen family and having intergenerational programs, having mentorship is such a huge and key part of our community because yeah, we can't yeah, look yeah. to our biological family or grandparents for support in our sexuality or gender identity. So it's important to make those spaces in order to create that chosen family. Isolated seniors and isolated youth pairing together, or even if they're not isolated and just want folks who have been around longer than them that um, they can look to as mentors, or even for seniors looking for a youth to be a mentor on perhaps trans rights, if that's something they haven't been exposed to. Or technology. Or technology. <laughs> Don't do this yet. Don't right. ask me to fix your technology. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very important um, aspect to be able to give to folks. I mean, we do have like little stories like where a youth has helped a senior get like a, a Facebook page just exactly. so they can be more social, right? And, and those things are kind of exciting because that's kind of a cool thing. Because I know many older folks, they, they have trouble with technology. I know I phone my son whenever I have a problem, and he says, you click this, you click, and I said, you're talking too fast. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, slow down. Slow down. <laughs> now, what do I click again? So I, I think it's important to recognize that, that it, it's a benefit for everybody. And, and you know, Bradford made the mistake of, of, not Bradford, but that person made the mistake of misinterpreting the gay community with pedophilia. And, and just because you're gay does not make you a pedophile. Yep. And you know, that's a whole different well, thing. Well, pedophilia is, is, right. is found among all. Yeah, right. and there's of lots life. of programs yeah. that, that mix adults with youth, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, whatnot, that, right. are, that are seen as spaces that aren't targeted towards sexuality and those don't get called pedophilia spaces so it's important to recognize the danger of being like queer spaces pedophilia right and also that we we have community partners like the Bradford Library the city of Bradford the city of Barrie wow what a what an amazing co uh, community partner to have like Jessica at the rec center is creating space to be inclusive for not only youth but older folks too like and the city of Barrie is actually going through the safer spaces like sending all their employees through that program to make sure they're being more inclusive for everybody and I have the pleasure of serving on the uh, the seniors advisory committee for the to the city council for mm -hmm. the city of Barrie just to make sure there's inclusion aspect to, to the overall city and I think those things are kind of exciting um, and that shows that there's progress being made by you know the Gilbert Center by the youth community yeah. and, and on that the Bradford Library and Bradford the city had our backs on that complaint. Right. They did. 100%. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, I want to get back to that point Allie about 
uh, biological parents and grandparents. Not all parents and not all grandparents are, uh, some are very receptive and very supportive of trans kids or, or queer kids, but not any, but not all. Um, it's, do you feel it's an important aspect in growing up is to have that support as much as possible within your own family, but if not, to try and get it outside of the family? Right, um, so I think that we might have been talking about this last time. The social support for queer and trans youth is very, very important. It can drop um, attempted suicide rates to 76% to 4%. Um, and so, yeah, if folks don't have it at home, it's important to form those spaces elsewhere. It's important that people are connected to community. And since community for queer and trans folks isn't always biological, Sometimes social spaces need to be formed, and both of our programs do a great job of helping folks form those spaces and giving that space so that even if you don't know anyone that's in your community, you can come in and drop in and say hi and start to form those connections and meet people. So, Jason, how do you, this seniors program is a new program. Right. You're the, you're the... Uh... I got it because of my gray hair, I know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you've, you've launched this program, what is what is what is an update on that? How have you? Because you were on the show a couple of months ago. Uh, well, when you first six, started, six now, months yeah. ago, yeah, yeah, last year actually. Right. <laughs> I know already, right? <laughs> and so you've made progress, obviously, and you're doing a lot of wonderful things. How have you found the uh, senior population receptive or wanting to be involved or embracing what you're doing and what you're doing with Ali? I, I think as the program grows, it's incredible to me the amount of um, feeling of a need that this actually is taking place. Um, we get calls from all over the province now because people are starting to hear this is what we're doing. We're, so we create that space for the older folks to get together and we have some amazing community partners like Midland, Wasega, Bradford, Barrie um, that allows us to kind of use space somewhere <laughs> that people feel comfortable to actually show up and socialize and meet other people that are in a similar situation. Like there's nothing like somebody in their 60s and 70s that, are, uh, that identifies as a lesbian but raised their kids and families and never been out as a, a lesbian and then they attend a social group and that's the first time they admit that they're actually a lesbian. Like those kind of things are incredible. Like in their 50s and 60s or? 70s. 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 Yeah, so like it's very, very cool and it's very satisfying for me um, with the program to actually have those experiences. And it's also talking about education, creating those educational opportunities. Like um, Simcoe Pride is a prime example of a, of a community partner that went out and surveyed 55 plus um, older folk. And one of the things we found out that we, I would never have thought in a million years is they want sex ed. And because they, they have no clue what to do or how to do things or do things safely or you know to make sure that there's, there's pleasure for both partners and and I as even me I, I know I look like I'm 29 but I recognize that but you know right well you know we yeah, try we're the same <laughs> yeah, yeah we're so close <laughs> a brother and sister I mean right. a year apart <laughs> two. so we don't but it just, when we talk about sex, you automatically assume as we got older that everybody knows everything you need to know about sex. You never think in the back of your mind going, oh, wait a minute. I mean, if, I mean, if I go by my grandmother's theory, it was two minutes of displeasure for peace in the home is what she called it. But, yeah, you know, but, but, but okay. sex is supposed to be good. It's supposed to be good for everybody. So that, that helped us recognize, um, I know when we talked about it a couple of times, we said, hey, this is something that we really should start looking into and providing that service so people can get the education they need. Um, and then, you know, and, and protect themselves and prevention and all the other things that go along with it. Because, you know, there's a lot of sex in a long-term care home, apparently, that uh, was quite surprising to me. Apparently. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> because out there, out there is youth are having sex, old people are sitting in rocking chairs. Right. But then along comes Viagra. <laughs> right. Along comes, along comes, suddenly seniors who are much more active than their parents were, and so they're not necessarily going into long-term care facilities at 70, 80. Some of them are very active and want to stay home. Right. We just assume that we're, we're a culture that worships youth, you know, youth, and, and, and do you think that's still, Ali, around, that the youth is still 
perceived as being, oh, I wish I was, because I remember working with seniors and going, oh, don't grow old, don't grow old, don't grow old. I, um, yeah, I actually have a very strong opinion on this. I think oh, that, God. <laughs> oh, oh, good. Strong. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I think that we're absolutely a, a culture that personifies youth. If you look at our media, it's always young folks that are being represented. If you look at almost anything, we're, we're visualizing youth, we're selling creams on how to look more youthful. Even if you're one of those rare people who have ever seen a dead body, um, it's particularly been made up to look very youthful. We are very, very afraid of aging and what that looks like and the next stages of our lives. And I think as a culture, we need to get a little bit more comfortable with the fact that as time goes on, everyone ages. And you end up looking like this. <laughs> I thought you looked 29. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> right. I thought you were more like 29. Right. And that again brings up the, po the whole point about LGBTQ seniors, especially among men, is that as they age, older queer men as they age, they figure they're less, they, they can become less attractive because they're aging and it's youth, youth centered. Do you feel that like for, for older gay guys, uh, unless, you, unless it's a dude that likes older men, or, you know, but as you age, you, you get a little bit of a b belly. <laughs> it's okay. I, I'm, I'm okay with my body. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm okay not body shaming. No, I'm, I'm not. just saying. I'm okay with it. I'm just saying as we all get older. Things we, moved. Yeah, I admit things that. Things move around. And so you become less attractive. And that, that helps. That doesn't help. I mean, that, that, that enhances isolation, depression. Uh, thoughts of suicide. Well, in our own community, it doesn't help sometimes because yeah. if you go on Grinder, for example, you say no old guys. Like, what does that exactly mean? And just because I'm older does not mean I want to have sex with you. Maybe I just want to have a conversation. I mean, I, I, I think we talked about being out at, at one of the bars on Church, Church Street and ended up talking to somebody who was like 25 and I was with a group of friends and he was alone, so we were talking to him. And it, one of the statements he made, well, I'm not going home with you. And it's like, it's okay, I'm not going home with you either. Because you live with your parents. Right, you live in your basement with your mom. But I mean, <laughs> but you know, the, the response is, well, then clearly you're not mature enough, first of all, to actually go home with me. And second of all, I'm just having a conversation. It's right. not all about having sex with you. You know, and people forget that that, as we get older, we like to socialize. I mean, I like to talk to people. I mean, you like to talk to people. No. No? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's important and it's part of um, the, the queer culture um, that this is a problem that we do to older folks for some reason because you've had things move around or you've got hair growing in places that's never grown before or whatever, the, you know. Like those, those so kind of things happen. I'm, I'm 27. <laughs> I'm not looking at you. It gets less on the head and grows in other areas, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, right? And it's like you, you shake your head because. <laughs> but that yeah. that is part of the problem yeah. that we yeah. do. That we and we don't and we don't respect the older folks in a sense of hey, let's have a conversation. Maybe we'll learn something. Hey, maybe they have a sense of humor. Yeah. You know, because yeah. I mean, some of us are fun. I hate to say it, we are. I think I am. Don't look at me. <laughs> I'm the funnest. Right. <laughs> but in some cultures, for example, the Asian cultures, Huge and respect. the indigenous cultures, age is respected. And they're looked to as being uh, individuals that can offer not just history, but also wisdom, years of living. I mean, even if you don't want to get experience just by mere living, 60, 70 years, you have experience, you've lived 60, 70 years, it gives, it gives you experience, which youth don't have. And we know that nothing really changes. Well, Styles, you know, what, what someone's wearing today is what someone wore 30 years ago. Right. I mean, except for bell-bottom pants, they haven't come back yet, thankfully. Thank God. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, that right. is a good thing. <laughs> but, you know, it's just like, you know, I'm, like my parents told me certain things that I was going to make mistakes and don't do this, don't do that. I find myself doing the exact same thing with my son, who's 23, and I tell him the same thing, knowing full well that he's probably just going to do it anyway, because I did the exact same thing. I'm sure you probably experienced that as well. I, I may have made <laughs> some mistakes <laughs> at some point, right. maybe. On one, on one hand, maybe three, yeah. Right. I need more hands. <laughs> <laughs> but I find myself the same way. My dad, who uh, is gone now many, many years, but I remember every time he took a trip, he'd wash the car and vacuum it and clean it all up. And I find myself doing exactly the same thing. And when I'm doing it, I'm going, 
Oh. Right? <laughs> you know, like, or you my say, father lives in me. Or you say something to somebody and you're looking around, I swear, <laughs> I, who, what? no, that was not me. That was my mother or my father. Like, but we do it all the time, and and but we, but we we don't take that wisdom for like we, I think when we when I was younger, I never took that wisdom for what it was worth because it's the worth is huge, yeah. and we just kind of dismiss it that oh you don't know what you're talking about things have changed, well not everything has changed so and we forget that as we kind of grow up I know that's from my experience anyway. Well, there's a saying there's nothing new under the sun. Youth, uh, if I can point this to you, Ali. Youth, when I was young, my parents knew nothing. Oh, they don't know anything. <laughs> they're old. Right. They're old. They're old. They're in their 40s. They're old. Never right. mind. Oh, somebody. my God. That was ancient. <laughs> Wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. You know, when you're 15, 16, somebody in their 30s or 40s, oh, my. <laughs> As we get older, the line keeps moving. I don't know if you The line keeps getting yet. shorter. <laughs> right. 70 is a new 20. <laughs> right. <laughs> is, are youth still that kind of thinking that older folks really don't know what they're talking about or don't know that much or I mean I think that youth really do want to connect on some sort of advice level but I think that the delivery of how that advice is told and heard is a little bit different than um, one would think I think that you really have to if you're going to give advice to a youth you need to recognize that they're probably not gonna follow it if you give it directly but if you lead that person there in a nuanced way that makes sense to them, then they probably will hear it in a different way. And so I think that maybe just working with folks around communication styles and delivery leads to folks taking that advice in and also folks being heard. Because my youth are constantly coming to me for advice. Uh, maybe that's because I look 15. Um, and so they think of me as a peer. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll pick that up when we come back from break. We're going to go to break. We'll be back with Allie and Jason. I'm back with Jason and Alan from the Gilbert Center. Alan. Allie. Alan. And, you know what, before we went to break, Jason was there and Ali was there and now Ali is here and Jason is there and we figure that Ali is going to get more wisdom by sitting in that chair, the vibes, and Jason will be young. It's transformation. I will feel younger. You'll feel like you're 25. I can't wait. And Ali will feel like they are 51. older. 51. <laughs> older, older. I already feel 51. <laughs> before we went to break, Ali, you were telling us about... <laughs> you were telling us we were talking about youth and if they if they look to the older generation for wisdom or for advice is that is that something that youth are looking to when you look at um, intergenerational are they looking to see how they can benefit from from uh, from uh, programming that works with seniors I think that it is really important to note that seniors can benefit from youth and can learn advice from youth as much as youth can can gain some wisdom from seniors I think that um, the dynamic that is often told is that senior folk have all of the knowledge and they're going to instill it on the youth who are blank slates but youth are actually coming to the table with a lot of their own wisdom and ideas and I think that it's important to note that in 2000 years from now people will probably laugh at our society about how wrong we were just about everything so all of us are just wrong um, <laughs> <laughs> and as the generations go we just become a little bit less wrong each time and so youth are taking on lessons from older generations and that foundation is being laid whether or not it seems like youth are being um, receptive of that or not that that is a foundation that does happen and has happened throughout time um, and to note that it's important to to remember that youth also have wisdom that they can impart on folks that are 60 years older than them 50 however um, we we are lucky I've learned a lot I think we've learned a lot from each other mm -hmm. yeah. just by working together I know my pronoun use is much better now than it was six I months know, ago I know that's another thing right pronouns were not a factor when we were growing up no <laughs> I mean it was he and she and that was it yep that's and right. if there were trans folks around we didn't know uh, you know and even even um, uh, common law marriage 
it, it was going on, you just didn't call it that, but uh, I remember my parents had neighbors at the cottage and Mr. and Mrs. Sear, but it, we, all, we only found out years later that Mr. and Mrs. Sear were actually not married, but they just happened to have the same last name, which worked perfect for them. Oh, dang. <laughs> but, but they, were, they wow. weren't husband and wife. Wow. Yeah, but they had the same last name, so it was, oh, Mr. Sear and Mrs. Sear. We just assumed right. they were married, and then one day when Mother thought we should know the real story behind it. Because you got to know what the neighbors are doing. <laughs> and we went, what? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I know that when I worked with seniors, it was interesting because when we talked about drugs, for example, a drug culture, and youth are so are into drugs, but so are seniors. Seniors have been into drugs for decades and decades and Lots decades. decades. Being into yes. drugs is a human experience. Yeah. It is, but I mean, there's a common thread, I would think, that Seniors do drugs. I, I don't necessarily mean cocaine, or maybe they do, but but marijuana is something that seniors are starting to get into for pain and for relaxation and for anxiety and for a bunch of things. But then there's heart pills and and cholesterol pills and water pills and this pill and that pill. Those are all drugs, and youth have issues with drugs as well. It can be addictive and. Right. It depends on your relationship yeah. with that substance yeah. and what that looks like. Yeah. I think for youth and seniors, you can safely ingest any drug. Um, it's a harm reduction approach. It just depends on what your relationship with it is and are you using that safely. So that's something in common as well, isn't it? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I can think of... Uh, many years ago. Um, oh, yeah, yes. Yes. <laughs> I, do tell. I, I can, remember, can we talk? <laughs> yeah, I, I can remember, you know, trying pot and all that stuff. I remember my, my ex and you I tried. You tried pot many years ago? Yes. Okay. <laughs> For the record. For the, For the record. record. Oh, my God, <laughs> don't prosecute me. tried it. Allie doesn't seem to believe that, but anyway. <laughs> right. Do go on. <laughs> right. Um, but, like, and then when my son was getting into this thing who's in university and stuff it, it's like when my ex brought that up always oh, doing pot and all this other stuff I was like don't be a hypocrite so did we like you know like let's let's just make sure that it's done safely and in a way that isn't harmful um, but let's support that journey you know in a way that's good that we don't get into a road don't go down a road of addictions and and that as well because that's extremely important and then if we do end up in that road let's be prepared for that um, in the harm reduction approach so both your programs are operating right now in town yes what's coming up down the road I hear there might be a picnic and this coming summer oh yeah yeah we, we're trying a few things um, is that is that that's something that's both youth and 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 seniors together yes well there's youth week in May and mm -hmm. then there's the seniors month in June and I th we're trying an art project as well um, we're trying to set that up in order to um, expressions through art um, for seniors and youth mm -hmm. um, and then we're so going tell me about that so that's youth and seniors like painting together or collaborating on, a, on a, an art piece or yeah so we're we're still in the brainstorming stages of it but we're hoping to get uh, something together where youth and seniors can paint doors together um, with I think the theme of who are you in the community and like where is your place in the community and take an intergeneral um, approach to how those doors are painted but also doing it keeping in mind that we're not all artists and so just paint whatever um, you feel, and it, if it looks good, great. If it doesn't, great. <laughs> and the doors are like wooden, like doors. Like old wooden doors, yeah. Old wooden doors. And, and then we're hoping to display them around the city as we move forward, because um, the city of Barrie has been very receptive to the concept and, and helping create some So like space. hanging doors and having them on, on display? Yeah, so like even if we do an event like the Red Scarf Gala in November, like having that down the walkway where people can see um, things that have happened over the year since last year, we, right, think, right, we just right. think it's all kind of cool. Wow. Yeah, so. And then maybe somebody will buy one, I don't know, oh. and raise money for the <laughs> Tillward Center. Oh, so, oh, I see. So <laughs> right. It could be a fundraiser. It could be in itself. It could be in itself. And, and, we, and where are you going to get the doors? Um, like, so we're looking at a few options. I've been contacting a few folks trying to find um, used doors that have been donated from teardowns. So right. ongoing process, we're looking. That's good. That's good. That's interesting. And what else? So the picnic. the picnic is a... August seventeenth, but it's an inter but it's it's youth and seniors coming together. Yes. Um, well, the Barry fifty five plus program, Simcoe County, uh, Simcoe Pride, 
um, at the Gilbert Center and all of us have come together and said let's create a space for family or your chosen family your blood family whatever you see, however you see your right, family right, right. let's create a space for you to come as that family um, so we're actually um, Parkview on August 17th noon to 3 um, we're just still figuring things out but we are doing it one way or another we know there will be hamburgers and hot dogs we know that the Barry Labor Council is actually going to help create that so we can give away free hamburgers and hot dogs and stuff like that face painting games that kind of stuff air hockey air hockey apparently there's a big blow-up thing that is a hair hockey apparently somewhere. yeah yeah need that yes yeah. I think so yeah and, and then there's something else called um, performative genders yeah which is something I just heard recently and I thought that's an interesting This was word. an education piece for me. <laughs> As the seniors, yeah, we're yes. getting to know performative genders, and Ali, I'm sure, can speak to it. Right, so going uh, straight <laughs> Judith Butler style on it, um, drag stuff, drag culture, has traditionally not always felt that good for trans people um, for a few reasons. One, some trans folks may feel as though drag performances might be a sort of like making fun of their identity at times. Mm. And it certainly has been at times, more so historically, more so in the past. I think that we've moved away from it and realized um, that we shouldn't be doing that as a community, which is great. Um, and so given that we have started moving towards more of a performative gender approach, so it's not necessarily dress up as the gender that is not a gender identity that you identify as, but it's more perform a gender, make your gender performative, um, be exuberant about a gender identity, whatever one you want, and that leads for trans folks to be able to participate in that, because if they are trans and they don't necessarily want to um, dress up as a gender identity that they don't identify as because that might be triggering and harmful, they can dress up as a gender identity exuberantly that they identify as, and I think that that feels much better and more inclusive for trans folks and leads them to be included and acknowledges that drag doesn't need to always look like one thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, I didn't, I've never thought of it that way either. I mean, this is one of the things I've learned from Ali, which I really appreciate. I mean, I never would have thought of this stuff. It changes though, isn't it? Language changes from one generation to the next where the younger generation embraces a new term for what the older generation used to say it's dry king dry queer. queen now it's performative genders who knew queer like queer when i was younger the word queer was derogatory and offensive and then i sat in in a meeting with youth and ellie and they were using queer this queer that. I was like, oh. <laughs> like you know every time it was well, said i cringed but when i was growing up in the 60s um where it was against the law to be gay or homosexuality. It wasn't even the term gay wasn't even there. Queer, and I remember Thursdays was Queer Thursday, and it was okay to be queer on Thursdays, but you couldn't be queer. Not the rest of the week. <laughs> Not the rest of the week, but Thursday was Queer gay Thursday. Day. Gay, it was like gay day. Gay day. And 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 straight guys and do everybody embrace. Oh, it's Queer Thursday. I remember. I, I never won't say his name because he's. Who knows? He could be living in Barry. Right. Yeah, I remember coming up behind me and grabbing, and going. Jerry, it's Queer Thursday. I can hug you. Ooh. And I'm like, uh, oh my God. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. That's a lot. Couldn't wait for Thursdays to come, right? You yeah. know? Oh my God, it's Thursday. Thank God. That's how I feel every day now. Every day in Hawaii is a gay day. <laughs> but, okay, so this is a question I have for Allie because performative genders I get, mm -hmm. but where does it come from? Like, where does, how does language change? Like, who gives the youth this terminology? We don't like drag queen, we don't like drag king because it's not what we feel is, is inclusive. We need performative genders. That language comes from somewhere yep. because it's being embraced. You're now, there, there's an example of youth educating seniors or older folks about, no, that's not good anymore. Where? Right. So that specific language actually comes from Judith Butler. Um, she is a feminist sort of writer. And she theorized that gender is always performative. So when I leave in the morning, I put on my clothes and I put on gender markers. I cut my hair in a certain way. All of these things are, are overt gender markers that other people can use to describe me um, or visualize what my gender identity may be. Um, so it implies that gender is always a performance. And so I think that queer and trans folks have really taken on that theory and, and utilized it in a way where it's like, 
yeah, maybe drag isn't the best. Maybe we should just exuberantly perform genders. So I, that is where the terminology performative genders is coming from, Judith Butler. Oh, good to know. I remember when older women, particularly, if they still like dyed their hair and wore short skirts and we'd say, oh, they're dressing way beyond the tissue. Well, my grandmother would say they were loose. <laughs> That's what my grandmother used to say. Hey. Or, know, or like harsh. Right? Or older women that had longer hair. Oh, this, she shouldn't have longer hair. She should have short hair because older women shouldn't have long hair. You know, growing up, you had the do's and don'ts, and you wonder where do they come from, these do's and don'ts. And it was just a, a cultural thing. Society just expected it. Now, it, it's, it's changing so much. It's, it's probably less concerning for someone now from my age and your age because we're we're younger than our parents were at the same age but my sense is that my dad when he was my age resisted change resisted anything that was different than what he was normally used to seeing or so a woman with with long hair in her 60s or 50s was wrong 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 now I think a lot of seniors look at that and go whatever I'm thinking and the youth has helped us do that would you both agree or am I just no I, I, I think that's pretty valid I, I think I mean I'm very lucky my parents were very very accepting just for the person whoever were, they didn't you know they just accepted you for whoever you however you identified whoever you were but my grandparents now that's right like, on my dad's side was different but on my mom's side was a very challenging because it was all racist and homophobic and my god but, like but then it was racist it was normal it, we didn't look at we didn't talk about it as racist when we used the n-word or when we used um, racial slurs we didn't look at it as being racial we just because that was an everyday language today those kinds of words would get you fired from an uh, from a, or off TV or whatever yeah, and rightfully so, oh, yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. as they should yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly yeah, we, we definitely agree with that I mean I I mean I've, I've learned a lot it's it's even like um, making the person of color account for, like when I was younger we were when I was in corrections the the, the thought process was at that time and I'm sorry I'm not gonna say what year but um, it's okay yeah You're among friends <laughs> right <laughs> who knew <laughs> who knew who's listening it's just the three of us <laughs> right. <laughs> right so the the discussion was is that um, persons of color is accounted for like 90% of the violent crime but as I got older and I realized wait a minute yeah. they don't account for all this crime it's because we've targeted that community we're policing that community, community yeah. and not everybody yeah. else yeah like it, and personifying their crime in a way that makes right. them seem as more hardened criminals than that community really is and perpetuating that stereotype and it comes from the prison industrial complex on how to get more bodies in prison especially specifically because after um, slavery was abolished in America there was no way to keep the economy going without have filtering people into the prison industrial system and so what did they do they made um, the stereotype that black folk were criminals and hardened criminals and then police them and put them into the prison system to keep um, exploiting that slave labor so our prison industrial complex is very much so still remis reminiscent of that and the way that policing sometimes works is reminiscent of that still and it's people like Ali for me that made me look at this as a very different lens and I mean that and when I realized oh my god that's so logical and, and makes perfect sense you, your whole perspective of everything changes like um, like Black Lives Matter and when we get into all that stuff now I now I'm understanding and now I support that like you need that space and and for us as allies for those community is creating that space so they can be heard and not but, speaking for yeah, them but when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s as a young man boys were expected to play hockey right girls and take did home ec girls did home ec girls were expected not to be that didn't have to be that well educated because after all they just get married and then have babies and the men would support them that was the thinking that was the culture that was embedded into many many of us both male and female now we're growing up in a culture where it doesn't work anymore you, you, you just you can't tell your kids 
you can't tell your son you need to play hockey. You need to know how to change spark plugs. Right, right. <laughs> and I remember saying to my father, well, I like curling. It's not hockey. Yeah, but it's on the ice. It's still, no, that doesn't work. I but remember that. Remember? That it's, it's dirty. I'm sorry. I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, just, <I> don't <laughs> change oil. There's a garage what? station. <laughs> Who, who's going to fix that? The purse first and then that answers the phone. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but boys were expected to do boy things. There were boy things and dress like boys. You know what I'm saying? Like, and then girls were expected to wear dresses and not above the knee, but below the knee and have their hair long and curly and be girly. And, and uh, if a girl was interested, if a female was interested in doing mechanics, ugh, wasn't allowed. Was, right. was, you know, and, and that, kind of, that kind of stereotyping was embedded into so many of us. So then as seniors, as we go into seniorhood, we realize, wow, <laughs> we've got to start shaking this. But we grew up in our formative years, that was embedded into our thinking. And sometimes for some of us, it's hard to shake it. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> it's, no, it is, it's hard to shake. Yeah. I mean, that's where we're coming from, a culture that, that, that had those stereotypes embedded in the school system, in the, in the religious system, in every system it was there. And that's why I think intergenerational is really important. Yes. Because we, uh, older folks, learn from younger folks like Ali, and it makes us look at things very differently, and we become more aware of some of these things that we're talking about that just, just decimated individuals from being who they are or prevented them from living their life to the fullest. And, and I think, too, I, I don't know, but correct me, well, I'm not going to be wrong about this because I think I'm right on it, but, but youth can learn from seniors and seniors can learn from youth. And it's not that youth are wrong or seniors are wrong or one is right and one is more, one is more right than the other, but it's going, it's like when, I, when we talked about performative genders, it's not like I'm resisting that term. Well, that's ridiculous. No, no, it's drag. You're embracing it in the sense that you're open to understanding this is why performative genders is being used. And I think if seniors embrace that kind of thinking and, and youth come at it, we're going, oh, right. When they grew up, this was the N words. Now it's no longer that, it's this. And so as seniors, we learn, oh, because that was really performative genders. And then <laughs> I, I, I went to some meeting and mentioned that to somebody else and they said, where does that come from? Allie. <laughs> <laughs> Allie. <Dang>. My reference <laughs> is Allie. <laughs> but I think the important thing for both of us to realize is that we have to be willing to learn, right? We have to learn from each exactly. other. And we have to ask questions if we don't understand. And knowing that that person is receptive to those questions. And Allie, for me, is that prime example of, of, a, of a good example for everybody in the community. I love that this has turned into praise me. I love <laughs> it. Right? <laughs> But, I'm into this. But, but, <laughs> but we can go to Ali and ask questions. If yeah. I have a question that if I have a trans client, I, you're one of the first people I go to. Like, are we doing this right? What can we do better? How do we support that person? And but as seniors, I hope we you do the yeah. same for me. Of like, course. Right. Yes. <laughs> but as seniors, you and I grew up with mom is right, dad is right. We don't question authority. Now we find, well, we did at some point, but now youth, it's not that they question authority, they ask themselves, why? <laughs> Why is that? Why is it that way? Yeah. And that's not a bad thing. It's important to not just say this language is bad, but also to explain why that language doesn't work or doesn't fully make sense. Just like how you're asking me about the performative gender piece, I'm explaining it to you and you're going, huh, yeah, that makes sense. And then we can move on from that. It comes back to everyone's just wrong and sometimes we're less wrong than usual. Um, but in 2000 years, people are going to look at us and laugh at how wrong we were. <laughs> <laughs> I, ha I have a cousin who has um, twin, twin daughters. One daughter is pink ballerina. The other one is blue jeans, t-shirts, and in the mud type, ty type of child, right? Mud. <laughs> Gross. And, and all along, and, li and like short hair, not long hair, wanted to be more like her brothers. Doesn't mean that she, that's how they felt who they were, right? And so there was a lot of pressure on the one that to look more girly, and, but not the girly one, to look more like the more masculine, the more, the more male-like, as they, anyway, so I have an aunt that's 100, and she's gonna be 101. Anyway, so all this argument, she was not doing well in school, they were not doing well in school, they, they, would, they, would, they would be put in a dress, and then next thing you know, they'd find their brother's pants and put it on, but they were too big and try to make it work. And finally, at one family reunion, my older aunt, who's 101 now, this year, said, why don't you just let them dress the way they want to dress? Right. Yeah. <laughs> why don't you, if they want short hair, why don't you just, let, who cares? You know what? It worked. They excelled in school. They were a lot happier. 
it, it doesn't mean anything other than this is what they felt comfortable in. And I think this is part of what showed me is my aunt, who's 101, my father's, my, the only one that's left in my father's family. I thought, wow, she gets it. Mm -hmm. She understands that to let a child be who they are is the best way for that child to develop and, and be enriched in, in whatever it is that they want to accomplish in life. Yeah, and, and it's important uh, to remember that it doesn't really impact anything other than maybe having that person feel more comfortable and excel more. I was lucky enough that when I was a little teenager with long hair, my mom actually approached me and was like, you don't like that hair, I can tell you don't like that hair, we're going to cut it right now. We're going to get really? shorter. Yep. Yeah. And so my mom cut my hair in the kitchen to be super short and I felt so much more comfortable going to school and just being me and occupying spaces because I liked how I looked more and it felt right. And having that parental support. And I remember asking her, being like, will uh, my dad be really angry about this? And she goes, oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and and that was such a great attitude to have and I still fully remember this right and I think that it's important to remember that youth if you do something even if it doesn't seem all that much to you if it's something so trivial as a haircut it might have such an impact on someone that they remember it 10 years later more than that 15 years later they might remember that and remember that moment and that you supported them I remember growing up I think you might remember Jason maybe you were too young but I remember growing up where men never wore earrings like any kind of ear, never wore earrings, rarely wore rings, never wore uh, tight clothes. Straight guys never wore tight. Now, straight guys have earrings, ponytails, tight clothes. Yeah, when I grew up, if you wore an earring in your left ear, you were gay. That was a signal. Oh, was And it? if you wore a pinky ring, that was the other side. I still side. see folks with those symbols. Yeah, and I... Really? Yeah. Today? yeah. Oh, like older and queer folks with yeah. the earring on their left ear? I still see that. Those were the signals when I was in my teenage years that you were open to the gay co gay community. If you had an earring in your left ear, yeah, mm -hmm. but not in your right. Right. What? Okay. Yeah. I don't know why and who yeah, thought of this. Well, exactly what we've been talking earlier when I said to Ali, like, where does this language come from, and who, who says, no, this is the way it's, it's it, this is the way we have to address drag. Well, I didn't. Even, it's like handkerchiefs. I had no idea until I Googled it. Well, wasn't there keys too? And there was yep. keys. Keys and, on the right yeah. side meant something, and keys on the left meant something else. But that was all in a time where people were just homosexuality was wrong, and you weren't allowed to be. Yeah, so you use like coded coded messaging. So you can meet in secret and <laughs> do all so those was, secret things. And all but youth today, uh, yeah, no, I agree. So we grew up in a generation where everything was hush hush, and rightly so, until 1969, like I said earlier in the show, it was a criminal offense to identify or to be a homosexual. Uh, I don't know about being a lesbian, but I know about being, being, being a male. <laughs> right. I, don't know, I don't know if the lesbians. Because two women living together was not, a, was not unheard of, and, and women then could women could walk down holding hands and nobody got offended, really. Mm. Do you think? People get offended. Um, Do they? Yep. Not too long ago, I was walking in the mall with my sister, holding my sister's hand, and people yelled at us. And that was no. a few months ago. People get offended. Um, and I think that, oh. that the reason why it's perceived that, that two women um, dating is more acceptable is a form of uh, misogyny where if two women are together it's seen as something that's over sexualized and therefore okay because it's acceptable to straight men and that is a huge form of homophobia within the community and we need to not pretend like that's not an overt form of homophobia. But women go to the washroom together. Two women go to the washroom together. I don't, well, and we I, don't think anything of it. But imagine you and I sitting and I'm saying hey you want to go to the washroom? People go. Okay. <laughs> what are they doing? But like, but two women can go to the washroom, and we don't we don't seem to. Right. But it doesn't seem to trigger anything in in my mind. Right. But if you go to Europe, it's a much different attitude. It's like they're much more advanced when it comes to things like this. Like the UK is a prime example where two women holding hands or whatever, and like nobody bats an eye, because it's common. It's like nobody thinks anything of it, and whether they're lesbians or not or whatever, it, nobody cares. Well, you you just don't go there. European culture. I remember when I was in. Well, in, in France, anyway, men hugging and and uh, yeah, not uncommon, and, and kissing on the cheek, or in Italy, you see that, and it's just it's just um, affection, but it's got nothing to do with anything more than that, right? And we seem to be in North America, we seem to be very, um, <gasps> oh my God, yeah, not as not as comfortable 
with, as you mentioned earlier in the show, Jason, about touching and, and feeling a hug doesn't mean it's anything more than just a hug, but now we're so afraid of, of hugging, we're so afraid. I remember opening a door for a woman one time and she looked at me and she said, you know, I can open the door myself. And I thought, <laughs> okay. Well, it's not, it's not also asking if you can hug first, like getting that consent piece is really important mm -hmm. too. Because some people aren't comfortable in recognizing that. But if you ask, I, I find most people are, yes, definitely give me a hug. And, mm -hmm. but and on, if they say no, then at least you didn't yeah, yeah, hug you them ask. anyway, yeah. they're uncomfortable. And I mean, because it could trigger somebody if you hug them without them, it's always good to ask. And I remember growing up too that in public transportation, if a woman got on the bus, it didn't matter if she you was older up. or younger, you had to get up and give her a receipt, especially if you were a youth. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and if you didn't, they could just pick you right up and <laughs> you stand. I'm, I'm young, I'm older, I'm sitting. Right. That was, it was just a culture we grew up in. And now, uh, I, I think the programming that you two have, because we're coming close to the end of the program, and that, that you're bridging, you're trying to bridge that gap where there's an appreciation. And I think that's, a, that's to be commended because it's important. Even in today, you think 2019, who knew? But it's still a lot of the same stuff that we were dealing in the 60s and 70s still is occurring from what I'm hearing from Ali, it's still going on. Mm -hmm. So thankfully you're there to educate us <laughs> about, about what to say and what not to say and how to say it. And youth are much more, much more apt to give, I would think, their opinion, don't you think? Oh yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. No hesitation. No, no hesitation. hesitation. I think that we're starting to focus on open and honest and direct communication, right. and I think that the youth are really taking that on, and it's something that I am constantly learning to do, and I'm often learning from Jason how to do that, and that is a big intergenerational piece. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, Ali just has to give me the look now, and I. Oh I mean, no! They, just, I, correct, know, I correct. I correct myself. They don't even have to. They, they don't even have to speak to you. They right. just. They, they just look at you, and you go, "Okay, I got it." We right. are a married couple. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Full circle. So the wedding invitations after the show are going to go out. Is that what I'm hearing? We're sure. just going to city hall. Okay, so yeah, you have to city hall. <laughs> so, so you have youth week coming up in a couple of weeks, months, yep. a month. Yeah, youth in week May? in May, and that's that's a whole week of activities that. Yeah, the 1st to 7th, uh, we are partnering with the Aurelia Public Library as well as Good. the City of Barrie yeah. to advocate for their youth events as well as throw in a couple of our own in there. Yeah, and you're doing seniors and... We have the entire month of June. Of <laughs> course, the whole month. <laughs> right. Because seniors, seniors, seniors can't do it just one day or two days, it's a whole month. Yeah, we're doing the month. Well, congratulations to both of you on the work that you're doing and uh, I look forward to... Uh, hearing what the new terms are going to be next time hopefully you come back on the show and we'll talk about it all over again <laughs> and how all this how this transpired youth week and seniors week and are seniors invited to youth and youth invited to seniors of course absolutely thank you so much thank for you. coming good to thanks see you. jerry thank you so much for coming and again congratulations on your programming and look forward to uh the events hope we get invited maybe i'll take my show on yeah bring it thank you very much for watching catch you next week